Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this IIEA webinar. And we're delighted to be joined today by Sir Lawrence Friedman, Emeritus Professor of War Studies, who's been generous enough to take time out of his schedule to speak to us. Professor Friedman will speak for about 20 minutes uh, or so, and then we'll have a Q&A session with our audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function that you should see on your Zoom panel in front of you. And please feel free to send in any questions you wish throughout the session as they occur to you, and we'll come to them at the end. When Professor Friedman has finished his presentation, uh, I, I'll then go to those questions. Just a reminder that today's presentation and the Q&A is are both on the record, and please feel free to also join in on our Twitter handle, at IIEA. I now have the pleasure of formally introducing Sir Lawrence Friedman and hand over to him just briefly after that. Sir Lawrence Friedman is Emeritus Professor of War Studies at King's College, London, where he was Professor of War Studies from 1982 to 2014 and was Vice Principal from 2003 to 2013. Before joining King's, he held research appointments at Nuffield College, Oxford, IISS, and the Royal Institute of International Affairs. He was elected a Fellow of the British Academy in 1995, and he was appointed official historian of the Falklands campaign in 1997. And in June 2009, he was appointed to serve as a member of the official inquiry into Britain and the 2003 Iraq War. Professor Friedman has written extensively on nuclear strategy and the Cold War, as well as commenting regularly on contemporary security issues. His new book is Command, The Politics of Military Operations from Korea to Ukraine. And I would like to hand over to Professor Friedman, Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mark. It's a great pleasure to be with you, if only virtually. Um, so what I thought I'd do, um, because I was particularly asked to talk about Ukraine, uh, is if I may just say a little bit about the book, but not too much, and then move on to um, what Ukraine tells us about some of the issues of command. Um, so the, the, the point about the book was that I wanted to look quite hard um, following on from previous work on strategy at the point at which strategy turns into action which is um when the orders have to be given the movements made um and command uh, uh describe that but i didn't want to do sort of a a big old history going right back to ancient times as i've done with strategy um i was particularly keen to look at post 45 conflicts and um because i don't think these are considered in the same sort of depth as we tend to look at the first and second world wars so um and i wanted to look at countries not just the us and uk which i know best uh, but at many other types of conflict so just to give a, my plug for the book it, it covers a wide range um of conflicts um from uh, colonial conflicts with the french in indochina and algeria to uh, post-colonial in, in the Congo, um, to uh, to contemporary conflicts. Now, Ukraine came in um, even before the Russian invasion. I had a chapter on Ukraine going back to 2014. And it is important to keep in mind that this war didn't start in February 2022. It started in March 2014 when uh, Russia uh, took in the next uh, Crimea from Ukraine uh, but as the book was being completed um, the invasion did take place so uh, it fitted in it seemed to me quite well with the with the existing manuscript to to add to the chapter on Ukraine material on on, on what had happened since and it's sort of up to date to, to the sort of summer of last year but I don't think the major issues um, have changed that much in terms of the two areas which I, I'd like to focus on. The first is, is the uh, political side of the story. The book, in a way, is, is, is seeking to show that at the highest level of, of civil-military uh, civil relations, when decisions on war are being made and acted upon, uh, that you can't simply say that the politicians decide on the objectives and the military decide on the means. Um, politicians should at least take military advice on the feasibility of their, um, 
of meeting their objectives by military means, and the politicians are certainly going to take an interest in how the military is pursuing uh, the objectives. Uh, they're the ones who have to explain the costs of the war in the end to their people. And what's interesting about, um, about the Ukrainian example, about essentially the Russian example, is it reinforces what, what turned out to be one of the themes of the book, which is the problem of autocratic decision-making. It, it's one of the features of the dictatorships, which essentially is what Russia has become, uh, is that they can take bold, audacious decisions and catch people by surprise. But they can do that because they're not necessarily very good at taking advice, uh, at inviting criticism and caution. Uh, and this has turned out to be a very striking example of that, that Putin, um, whether or not because of COVID, had isolated himself from um, uh, from many of his officials uh, and conjured up this idea about uh, dealing with the Ukraine problem for Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine problem for Russia, which is at root um, that has just fallen out of the Russian sphere of influence. It's, um, you know, there's lots of discussion about NATO enlargement and things like that, um, the impact of the color revolution and Euro maiden, but the basic problem going back to 1991 is the Russian difficulty of dealing with the idea of Ukraine as a separate independent state. And uh, Putin had hatched this idea that this was the time to deal with it, doesn't seem to have taken any advice even from Ukrainian experts on what um, on what might be done uh, or what the Ukrainians might do in response. The obvious lessons that you might have learned from both the Russian and the NATO experience in Afghanistan about the difficulty of subjugating countries where you're not welcome. All of these things seem to uh, have been dismissed on the basis of confidence about Russian military strength and um, dismissal of Ukrainian capacity to resist and, and, and their capabilities. So the, the, uh, the war was undertaken with very little notice. So not only did was the rest of the world surprised, Ukraine surprised, but Russia was surprised too. Its own commanders were not properly prepared for what they were undertaking. The troops weren't properly prepared. And it was... Uh, a bold plan that they had, but not really one that they could execute, nor did they have an easy plan B for when the first one failed. They um, attacked on far too many axes, uh, and they um, and once they got back bogged down, their logistics became vulnerable and very problematic. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, the, the starting point is, is the problem of an autocracy waging war. And I think what we're now seeing is the problem of an autocracy ending a war. Um, I think in a democratic society, if you put the country um, through what uh, Putin has put Russia with uh, tens of thousands killed, um, even more wounded, the uh, economy uh, which survived reasonably well last year now in, in increasing difficulty, um, isolation, and no gains, no serious gains. And they, they, they uh, at the peak of the operation just after the original invasion, they had about 27% of Ukrainian territory, some of which had been taken in 2014. Now they're down to 18%. We'll see how much they've got after becoming Ukrainian offensive. But the, the point is, uh, it's not coherent. The, the objectives which Putin has set, taking all of the Donbass and then taking all of the annexed um, uh, provinces in addition to Crimea, which was announced last September, none of these have been achieved. Well, in a democratic society, you would struggle with this. But the assumption is that in an autocratic society, um, one where dissent is crushed, you're, you're able to carry on and carry on, I suspect, because Putin fears the reckoning, fears the um, assessment of, of um, the losses incurred for such limited uh, limited gains, possibly no gains 
at all at the end. So um, it, it's an interesting feature of this situation that uh, it was easy, um, easier than normal to start this war, um, but also harder than normal to end it. It's difficult for Russia just to cut its losses and withdraw, though this would have been the sensible thing to do. On the other hand, with Ukraine, you see quite a different situation. The country um, is probably more united than it's ever been in its existence. It's mobilized for conflict. It's taken grievous losses, uh, both in the battlefield and in the battering of its cities, but it's shown resilience and, it, and it's still in there. And the leadership here, which has come from Zelensky, uh, is in remarkable contrast with to Putin. Uh, whereas Putin um, is uh, old, out of touch, uh, very wary about popular contact, repeats the same lines over and over again, not checking whether they bear any relationship to reality. Uh, Zelensky is a modern, young, uh, media savvy performer. I mean, people think of him as a comedian, but uh, he's actually also was quite a successful businessman. He has a law degree. He's very articulate. He pitches his messages very carefully. And it's not just that he's provided a unifying uh, leadership for Ukraine. He's been a very effective in pursuing a war policy, not in terms of telling the generals how to fight, uh, but in keeping up pressure constantly on uh, his Western supporters to provide him with weapons, to provide ammunition, uh, never suggesting that he's got enough, and always reminding people that this isn't a war just being fought for Ukraine, that if Ukraine fails in this, if it fell, then the consequences for Western Europe would be dire, um, and, and the long-term costs even greater. So you have a remarkable contrast in leadership here, uh, which again, we, we will see how this works out uh, over the final stages of the war. Uh, but for now, it demonstrates uh, the, the leaders able to connect with the people, able to take criticism and address it, are, are going to be in the longer run in a stronger position than autocrats who can suppress all dissent. The other side, the other aspect um, of the story that's interesting, is looking at the military side, is a contrast in in styles. This was very sharp initially, whereby on on the Russian side you had a very hierarchical command structure um, with orders handed down uh, and very little latitude apparently given to junior officers to shift. Um, to adapt them to the conditions in which they found themselves um, and troops more or less told to do um, uh, what was expected of them without uh, much chance to, to query their orders uh, uh, even though it kept on getting them into trouble and we saw in the initial days of the war Russian generals ending up putting themselves in danger because as their communication systems broke down or, or were um, penetrated by, by Ukraine. They actually found it difficult to have the conversations that would have allowed them to give better orders or, or to shift. So you have the problems again of a very hierarchical system, whereas the Ukrainian side, I think as much out of necessity uh, as preparation, had to rely on uh, small units uh, dispersed, doing what they knew they had to do, but not necessarily uh, fully coordinated by, by the center. Over time, I think um, more centralized uh, command systems have emerged in Ukraine. Uh, and I think that's unavoidable because you're going to have to use um, scarce resources, air power, ammunition, uh, uh, and as everybody can't, call them in at the same time. Somebody's got to decide how they're done. And I think you've seen uh, with the battle for Bakhmut, which has been the 
the, the longest and bloodiest of this war, that was back to last summer, still not over, uh, that it's, been, it's probably been the occasion where there have been the biggest debates within Ukraine about whether or not this uh, holding Bakhmut was the, was the wise thing to do, whether it had been better to, to shift back to uh, an easier defensive position or to deny the Russians everything that they wanted. But I think what you're now seeing is some vindication of the decision to hold on. And Bakhmut also illustrates something that has happened to the Russian command since, uh, since the start of the war. And what that is, is the increasing role of um, private military companies. Uh, Wagner Group is the most prominent of the lead, these led by Evgeny Prigozhin, but, but by no means the only one. There's quite a lot of these private armies knocking around, loosely uh, brought together. Uh, so you have um, a system which really wants unity of command, orders from the center, uh, rigorously obeyed. Yet there's constant negotiation going on um, with these various warlords. Kadyrov, the Chechen leader, is a is another one about who's going to play what role and what they're willing to do. And of course, with Bakhmut, we've recently had the spectacle of uh, Prigozhin complaining bitterly the Defense Minister Shoigu and uh, Commander-in-Chief uh, Gerasimov have failed to provide um, him with the ammunition that he needed to finish off the job. Uh, and yesterday, after a rather uh, lackluster victory parade in Moscow, uh, just after it had finished, Prigozhin released yet another video in which he said that, uh, the promised ammunition had yet to arrive, uh, and complain this time about Russian regular forces um, fleeing in the face uh, of a Ukrainian counterattack, a counterattack that the Ukrainians have since confirmed. Um, so again, you, it, it's a very different sort of um, system, uh, way of running a war in, in Russia to the Ukrainian way you've had uh, con continuity in command, uh, the, the, the same command, some of the um, intermediate commanders have been demoted or promoted, but there hasn't been any change at the top, whereas Russia keeps on going through different commanders in chief, um, reflecting, I think, the frustration with Putin you know, on Putin's side that he hasn't got what he expected and wanted out of this war. Just finally, to um, to wrap it up, um, just looking forward a bit and just assessing where we are at the moment. Uh, I mean, the key feature of the current situation is Russian failure. Uh, Russia uh, knew that the Ukrainians were going to be getting more weaponry in from the West, uh, could see that this would uh, enable a new Ukrainian offensive taking place about now, uh, and decided it needed to get its own winter offensive in, uh, despite the problems of terrain that uh, is created by boggy ground, um, decided to get its own offensive in before the Ukrainians got started. And what this led to was a, um, a push on a remarkably narrow front, really, um, which has ended up with them taking a few settlements, actually in April going backwards rather than forwards, with Bakhmut the key place, but uh, other places um, having their battles too, and really nothing to show. And even if some gains were made in the, in the last days of this offensive, compared with what was needed to meet Putin's objective, it's fallen far short and has left um, Russia really having to pivot to much more defensive positions and operations uh, without its own offensive having, having gained much territory and having lost, according to the Pentagon figures, 100,000 casualties, of which about 20,000 may have been killed. I mean, these, are, these are very round numbers, and, and how accurate they are, I don't know, but they give you an idea of the scale of what's been going on, certainly 
again, noting another unusual feature of this war, which you can watch on a pretty careful basis on social media, uh, certainly the, 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 there's more than enough grim evidence of, of Russian losses. So having held in Bakh Bakhmut, more or less, even, even if they have to evacuate um, that quite soon, the Ukrainians are now thinking very hard on, on how to mount their own offensive. And that's really what everybody is, is now waiting for. Uh, I think it, the, the Ukrainians have been engaged in some quite complex crisis, uh, expectation management over the last week or so, not so that people don't get ahead of themselves, assume amazing breakthroughs and successes, when it's going to be very difficult for them. Uh, one thing we've seen from this war is that um, the defences normally are stronger than the offences, and you need enormous effort to overcome them. So my guess is we'll see uh, more attacks behind the front lines, trying to weaken the Russian ability to adapt and respond, uh, probings to see where there might be weaknesses and vulnerabilities in the Russian position before we get to really big breakthroughs. And on this much depends, much depends on how the war, um, the next stage of the war, the CIA observed last week that the Russians probably can't mount another offensive this year. So you, Ukraine is the initiative for the moment, but there is also a strong view that if the Ukrainians can't make this work, then the pressure for some sort of ceasefire will grow, although it's actually quite difficult to see the terms on which that might be agreed. So we've reached the stage um, in this war of waiting and watching um, to, see, to see what happens next. But I think the only thing that we can be pretty sure of is that compared with what he wanted to achieve, this war has been a serious failure for Putin and has probably thrown back um, its um, military uh, position decades uh, because of the time it will take to recover and reconstitute from this really disastrous campaign. Thank you very much. Thank you.